The music of the spheres, or harmony of the spheres, is an ancient philosophical concept that regards proportions and the movement of celestial bodies as a form of music. The idea is most commonly attributed to Pythagoras, who is quoted as saying, There is geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres. This idea remained a central theme of philosophical thinking for more than two millennia, where numerous influential scholars used different metaphysical or aesthetic arguments to associate each celestial body with a certain pitch, according to the best musical theory of his time. In the case of Pythagoras, legend has it that he was walking past a blacksmith shop when his attention was attracted by the harmonious ringing of the anvil. On inquiring within, he was told that the hammers were of different weights, each one producing its own pitch. This explanation supposedly led him to the idea of musical intervals. While I like the story, it could also be that Pythagoras discovered consonances by experimenting with string length on a monochord, an ancient musical and scientific lab instrument involving one string. Consonants is defined as a combination of notes which are in harmony with each other due to the relationship between their frequencies. Pythagoras is accredited for discovering the simple fact that the pitch of a musical note depends on the length of the string which produces it. This allowed him to correlate the intervals of the musical scale with simple numerical ratios. And this is what a monochord looks and sounds like. An important point here was his attempt to reduce an element of human experience, in this case sound, to mathematics, which was an essential step in the development of science. A central belief of Pythagoras and his followers was that everything is number. Pythagoras thought that numbers were divine, and ironically an expression of God's mind. Pythagoras was also deeply spiritual in that he believed that the soul was immortal and imprisoned in the material body, essentially subscribing to the concept of reincarnation. Pythagorean philosophers believed that there was a close divine relationship between numbers and geometrical forms. For example, they revered the pentagram, as each diagonal divides the two others at the golden ratio. The golden ratio is commonly found in nature and was used in ancient architecture and can even be observed in music. A very simple yet effective articulation of this point was made during a Daffy Duck cartoon, as Walt Disney himself was rumored to be a Freemason. So I'd like to play a short excerpt of it now. Come on, let's go to ancient Greece, to the time of Pythagoras, the master egghead of them all. Pythagoras? The father of mathematics and music. 
Mathematics and music? Ah, you'll find mathematics in the darndest places. Watch. First, we'll need a string. Stretch it good and tight. Plunk it. Now divide in half. Plunk again. You see? It's the same tone, one octave higher. Now divide the next section. And the next. Pythagoras discovered the octave had a ratio of two to one. With simple fractions, he got this. And from this harmony in numbers developed the musical scale of today. Why, Gordo, you do find mathematics in the gorgeous places. You can imagine how excited Pythagoras was when he shared his findings with his pals, a fraternity of eggheads known as the Pythagoreans. They used to meet in secret to discuss their mathematical discoveries. Only members were allowed to attend. They had a secret emblem, the pentagram. Let's see what the topic is for today. It was our old friend Pythagoras who discovered that the pentagram was full of mathematic. The two shorter lines combined exactly equal the third. And this line shows the magic proportions of the famous golden section. The second and third lines exactly equal the fourth. Once again, we have the golden section. But this is only the beginning. Hidden within the pentagram is a secret for creating a golden rectangle, which the Greeks admired for its beautiful proportions and magic qualities. The star contains the golden rectangle many times over. It's a most remarkable shape. It can mathematically reproduce itself indefinitely. All these rectangles have exactly the same proportions. This figure also contains a magic spiral that repeats the proportions of the golden section into infinity. To the Greeks, the golden rectangle represented a mathematical law of beauty. We find it in their classical architecture. The Parthenon, perhaps one of the most famous of early Greek buildings, contains many golden rectangles. Portions are also found in their sculpture. In the centuries that followed, the golden rectangle dominated the idea of beauty in architecture throughout the Western world. The Cathedral of Notre Dame is an outstanding example. 
the Renaissance painters knew this secret well. Today, the golden rectangle is very much a part of our modern world. Modern painters have rediscovered the magic of these proportions. Leonardo da Vinci, like many other artists throughout the ages, made extensive use of the golden ratio to create pleasing compositions. In The Last Supper, the position of Jesus is perfectly plotted by arranging golden rectangles across the canvas. You can observe the golden ratio all around you. Flowers, seashells, pineapples, and even honeycombs all exhibit the same principal ratio in their makeup. In terms of music, each note has its own vibration and sounds that conform to the golden ratio are pleasing to the ear, while those that don't sound like there's something off. When a wrong note is played in a symphony, even the untrained ear can recognize that there's something wrong. It seems that we're somehow programmed to understand the mathematical relationship between notes and harmonies. The first confirmed discovery of a musical instrument we have comes from around 35 to 40,000 years ago, which has been claimed by some to use the same seven note scale we use today. The harmonic qualities of music can have a profound and beneficial effect on the human psyche. Plato said that, quote, music is a moral law. It gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, flight to the imagination, and charm and gaiety to life and to everything. A sound bath is defined as a deeply immersive, full-body listening experience that intentionally uses sound to invite gentle, yet powerful therapeutic and restorative processes to nurture the mind and body. There are different techniques and instruments that can be used. The first example here utilizes gongs. Please adjust your volume accordingly. Of course, there are a number of different instruments used in sound therapy, each with various healing results, depending on the individual, probably the most common being the crystal bowl.
are really for shifting consciousness and getting you deeper in, into these uh, very sublime energetic states. Now these are called rainbow bridge tinka bells because the, uh, the way they're fired it uh, creates this rainbow colors and his gong is a rainbow bridge gong and you, you will hear it in a minute. And so, uh, as usual, well, this, is, this is the original Tibetan model that, that wake up the seven chakras. And so I decided to do just a little sound introduction and uh, show you how I, I managed to uh, integrate that with my go old friend, my new old friend, the, the wolf. Okay. Hello everyone. Today we're going to look at a very simple instrument, very accessible to all of us, and one of the favorites amongst folks who attend the sound baths that I've done at Peace Awareness Labyrinth and Gardens in Los Angeles. It's called the Koshi chime. And here it is. It's a wind chime, but it's also actually a very highly tuned instrument and it has the sweetest of tones. Among other things, such as math and geometry, Pythagoras was also described as the father of music. Having discovered or rediscovered musical intervals, he taught that you could heal using sound and harmonic frequencies. He was the first person in recorded history to prescribe music as medicine. The concept was that each individual object, from the macro to the micro, had a particular sound, and that these unique individual rhythms and vibrations formed a universal harmony contributing to the whole. He affirmed that music is present everywhere and governs all temporal cycles, such as seasons, biological cycles, and all the rhythms of nature. Pythagoras condensed wisdom he had gathered through the mystery schools of Babylon, Egypt, and others, and synthesize these teachings into a new discipline which comes down to us as Greek philosophy, 
which uses number as its foundation, considered the most fundamental element of creation. To get to the core of his teachings, one had to endure three introductory years, followed by five years of absolute silence, followed by another five years of training. Only then were students ready to learn the most sacred mystery of numbers, which is called numerology, some elements of the Kabbalah, and how everything in the universe is really connected and can be accessed through the sacred science of numbers, geometry, and math. Generations of later Greeks built onto his philosophy, and Aristotle turned it into a science. But then came Christianity, and for the next thousand years, organized religion cast a shadow over science and aspects of the mysteries that became known as the occult. The study of visible sound is called somatics, and it reveals some fascinating truths about our universe that go unseen by the naked eye. Sounds actually have a distinct geometry, much like crystals and flowers and shells. When picked up by special apparatus, such as a sand-covered plate, these vibrations reveal incredible geometric shapes that are as unique and beautiful as snowflakes. There we are. Can you see the patterns on the top there? Now you'll see these patterns in nature. You see them on the back of tortoise shells. You see them in sunflower seeds. You see them in leaves. This vibration and the way it occurs is what's happening inside us. Let's do this one more time. A little bit more granulated sugar on the top. You can use salt as well. Take it away. So what happens is the higher the note, the more intricate the pattern. So once you get into ultrasound, things are very, very different. It was Nikola Tesla that once said, quote, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Which brings us to Dr. Reif, an American inventor who believed that everything vibrates at its own natural frequency. He attempted to discover the individual frequencies of disease-causing microorganisms in an effort to destroy them using the exact same vibrational frequency. In 1934, Reif used a beam ray machine he developed to cure 16 terminally ill patients with various cancers. The first 14 recovered in 70 days, the remaining two recovered three weeks later. Incredibly, the patients only required two three-minute sessions per week to achieve total recovery. Dr. Reif never claimed his machine was a cure for cancer and simply stated that it could, quote, devitalize diseased organisms in living tissue. He also warned about medical frauds that made such claims. An obituary in the Daily Californian described his death at the age of 83 on August 5, 1971, stating that he died penniless and embittered by the failure of his device to garner scientific acceptance. Reif blamed the scientific rejection of his claims on a conspiracy involving the American Medical Association, the Department of Public Health, and other elements of organized medicine which had, quote, brainwashed and intimidated his colleagues. After his death, ineffective imitations of his machine were marketed using Reif's name as a cure for AIDS, cancer, and other diseases, ending in several cases of health fraud in the U.S. While it is prudent to have some sort of quality control and consumer fraud protection in the medical field, it seems that the FDA and organizations such as the American Medical Association, which is largely funded by the Rockefeller Foundation, is ignoring, overlooking, and rejecting alternative cancer treatments, despite promising results from low-risk therapies such as those involving sound, frequency, and vibration. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. 
My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments, so kindly leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.